Chapter 29 At the test the next afternoon, Selina stood in the training hall with her arms crossed, watching Kane spar with Grey. Kane knew she was. All of her simpering and pretending and holding back had been for nothing. It had amused him. She clenched a drawer as Kane and Grey flew across the sparring ring, swords clanging. The test was fairly simple. They were each given a sparring partner, and if they won their duel, they needn't worry about being eliminated. The losers, however, would face judgment by Brulo. Whoever had performed the worst would be sent packing. To his credit, Grave held up again well against Kane, even though she saw how his knees trembled from the effort. Knox, standing beside her, hissed as Kane shoved into Grave and sent him staggering back. Kane smiled throughout the entire thing, barely panting. Selena clenched her hands into fists, pushing them hard against their ribs. In a flash of steel, Kane had his blade in a grave's throat, and the pockmarked assassin bared his rotting teeth at him. Excellent, Kane, Brulo said, clapping. Selena struggled to control her breathing. Look out, Kane, Varen said from beside her. The curly haired thief grinned at her. She hadn't been thrilled when it had been announced that she was to spar against Varen, but at least it wasn't Knox. Little lady wants a piece of you. Watch yourself, Farron, Knox warned, his grey eyes burning. What? Farron said. Now the other champions and everyone else were turning to them. Pella, who had been lingering nearby, retreated a few steps. Smart move. Defending her, are you? Farron taunted. Is that the bargain? She opens her legs and you keep an eye on her during a practice. Shut your mouth, you damned pig, Selina snapped. Cole and Dorian pushed off from where they both leaned against the wall, coming closer to the ring. Oh, what? Varen said, nearing her. Knox stiffened, his hand drifting to a sword. But Selena refused to back down. Or rip out your tongue. That's enough, Brulo barked. Take it out in the ring. Varen, Lillian, now. Varen gave her a snake-like smile and Kane clapped him on the back as he entered the chalk-etched circle, drawing a sword. Knox put a hand on her shoulder and out to the corner of eye, she spied Cole and Dorian watching them closely. She ignored them. It was enough. Enough of the pretending and the meekness. Enough of Cain. Farron raised his sword and shaking his blonde curls out of his eyes. Let's see what you've got. She stalked towards him, keeping her sword sheathed at her side. Farron's grin widened as he lifted his blade. He swung, but Selena struck ramming a fist into his arm, sending the blade soaring through the air. In the same breath, a palm hit his left arm, knocking it aside too. As he staggered back, her leg came up and Varen's eyes bulged as if it slammed into his chest. The kick sent him flying and his body crunched as it hit the floor and slid out of the ring, instantly eliminating him. The hall was utterly silent. Mock me again, she spat at Varen, and I do that with my sword the next time. She turned from him and found Brulo's face slack. Here's a lesson for you, weapons master, she said, stalking past him. Give me real men to fight. Then maybe I'll bother trying. She strode away, past the grinning Knox, and stopped before Cain. She stared up at his face, a face that might have been handsome had he not been a bastard, and smiled with sweet venom. Here I am, she said, squaring her shoulders. Just a little lapdog. Cain's black eyes gleamed. All I hear is yapping. Her hand itched towards a sword, but she kept it at her side. Let's see if you still hear yapping when I win this competition. Before he could say more, she stalked to the water table. Only Knox dared to speak to her after that. Surprisingly, Cole didn't reprimand her either. When she was safely back in her rooms after the test, Selina watched the snowflakes drift from the hills beyond Rifthold. They swept towards her, harpingers of the storm that was to come. The late afternoon sun, trapped beneath the wall of pewter, stained the clouds a yellowish-gray, making the sky unusually bright. It felt surreal, as if the horizon had disappeared beyond the hills. She was stranded in a world of glass. Selena left the window but stopped before the tapestry in its depiction of Queen Eleanor. She had often wished for adventure, for old spells and wicked kings, but she hadn't realised it would be like this. A fight for her freedom. And she'd always imagined that there'd be someone to help her. A loyal friend or a one-armed soldier or something. She hadn't imagined she would be so... Alone. She wished Sam with her, were with her. 
He'd always known what to do, always had a back, whether she'd wanted him to or not. She would give anything, anything in the world, to have him still with her. Her eyes burned and Selina put a hand to the amulet. The metal was warm beneath the fingers, comforting, somehow. She took a step back from the tapestry to better study the entire scope of it. In the centre stood a stag, magnificent and virile, gazing sideways at Eleanor, the symbol of the royal house of Terrison, of the kingdom that Brannon, Eleanor's father, had founded. A reminder that though Eleanor had become queen of Adalin, she still belonged to Terrison, like Selina. No matter where Eleanor went, no matter how far, Terrison would always own a part of her. Selina listened to the wind tower with a sigh. She shook her head and turned away from the evil in the castle. But the only and truly evil thing in this world was the man ruling it. Across the castle, Caitlin Rompier clamped tight lightly, clapped lightly as a troop of acrobats finished the tumbling. The performance had stopped at last. She didn't feel inclined to watch peasants bouncing about in bright colours for hours, but Queen Georgina enjoyed it, and invited her to sit beside the throne today. It was an honour, and had been arranged through Parrington. Parrington wanted her, she knew it, and if she pushed, she could easily get him to offer to make her his duchess. But duchess wasn't enough, not when Dorian was still unmarried. Her head had been pounding for the past week, and today it seemed to throb with the words, Not enough, not enough. Not enough. Even in her sleep, the pain seeped in, warping her dreams into nightmares so vivid she couldn't remember where she was when she awoke. How delightful, your majesty, Caitlin said as the acrobats gathered the things. Yes, they were rather exciting, weren't they? The queen's green eyes were bright, and she smiled at Caitlin. Just then, Caitlin's head gave a bolt of pain so strong she clenched her fists, hiding them in the folds of her tangerine-coloured gown. I do wish Prince Dorian could have been seen here to see them, though. Caelan got out. His Majesty told me only yesterday how much he enjoyed coming here. The lie was easy enough, and it somehow made the pain of the headache ease. Dorian said that? Queen Georgina raised an auburn eyebrow. Does it surprise your Majesty? The Queen put a hand to her chest. I thought my son had a distaste for such things. Your Majesty, she whispered. Will you swear not to say a word? A word about what? The Queen whispered back. Well, Prince Dorian told me something. What did he say? The Queen touched Caitlin's arm. He said the reason he doesn't come to court so often is because he's rather shy. The Queen withdrew, the light in her eyes fading. Oh, he's told me that a hundred times. I was hoping you'd tell me something interesting, Lady Caitlin, like if he's found a young woman he favours. Caitlin's face warmed and her head pounded mercilessly. She wished for a pipe, but hours remained of this court session and it would be improper to leave with it until Georgina departed. I heard, said the Queen under her breath, that there's a young lady, but no one knows who. Or at least, when they hear her name, it's nothing familiar. Do you know her? No, Your Majesty, Caitlin fought to keep the frustration from her face. What a pity, I had hoped you of all people would know. You're such a clever girl, Caitlin. Thank you, Your Majesty. You are too kind. Nonsense. I'm an excellent judge of character. I knew how extraordinary you were the moment you entered the court. Only you were suitable for only you were suitable for a man of Parrington's prowess. What a pity you didn't meet my Dorian first. Not enough, not enough, the pain sang. This was a time. Even if I had, Caitlin chuggled. Your Majesty surely would not have approved. I'm far too lowly for the attentions of your son. Your beauty and wealth compensate for it. Thank you, Your Majesty. Caelan's heart pounded quickly. If the Queen approved of her, Caelan could scarcely think as the Queen nestled into her throne, then clapped her hands twice. The music began. Caelan didn't hear it. Parrington had given her the shoes. Now it was her time to dance. Chapter 30 You're not focusing... Yes, I am, Selina said through her teeth, pulling the bowstring back even farther. Then go ahead, Cole said, pointing to a distant target along the far wall of the abandoned hallway. An outrageous distance for anyone, except her. Let's see you make that. She rolled her eyes and straightened her spine. The bowstring quivered in her hand, and she lifted the tip of her arrow slightly. You're going to hit the left wall? 
he said, crossing his arms. I'm going to hit you in the head if you don't shut up. She turned her head to meet his gaze. His brows rose and still staring at him, she smiled wickedly as she blindly fired the arrow. The whiz of the arrow's plight filled the stone hall before the faint, dull thud of impact. But they remained gazing at each other. His eyes were slightly purple underneath. Hadn't he got any sleep in the three weeks since Xavier had died? She suddenly hadn't been sleeping either. Every noise woke her, and Cole hadn't yet discovered who might be targeting the champions one by one. The who didn't matter as much as to her as the how. How was the killer selecting them? There was no pattern. Five were dead, and they had no connection to each other aside from the competition. She hadn't been able to see another crime scene to determine if ward marks had been painted in blood there as well. Selena sighed, rolling her shoulders. Kane knows who I am, she said quietly, lowering her bow. His face remained blank. How? Parenton told him, and Kane told me. When? She'd never seen him look so serious, and made something within her strain. A few days ago, she lied. It had been weeks since the confrontation. I was in the garden with Nehemia, with my guards, don't worry, and he approached us. He knows all about me and knows that I hold back when we're with the other champions. Did it lead you to believe that the other champions know about you? No, she said. I don't think they do. Nox doesn't have a clue. Cole put a hand on the hilt of his sword. It's going to be fine. The element of surprise is gone, that's all. You'll still beat Kane in the duels. She half smiled. You know, it's starting to sound like you actually believe in me. You'd better be careful. He began to say something, but running footsteps sounded from around the corner, and he paused. Two guards skidded to a halt and saluted them. Cole gave them a moment to collect their breath before he said, Yes? One of the guards, an aging man with thinning hair, saluted a second time and said, Captain, you're needed. Though his features remained neutral, Cole's shoulders shifted. His chin rose a bit higher. What is it? He said a bit too quickly to pass for concern. Another body, replied the guard. In the servants' passages. The second guard, a slender, frail, young-looking man, was deathly pale. You saw the body? Selina asked him. The guard nodded. How fresh? Cole gave her a sharp look. The guard said, I think it's from last night, from the way the blood's half-dried. Cole's eyes were unfocused, thinking. He was figuring out what to do. He straightened. You want to prove how good you are? He asked her. She put her hands on her hips. Do I even need to? He motioned the guards to lead the way. Come with me, he said to her over his shoulder. And despite the body, she smiled a bit and followed him. As they departed, Selene looked back at the target. Cole had been right. She'd missed the centre by six inches. To the left. Thankfully, someone had created some semblance of order before they arrived. Even still, Cole had to push his way through a crowd of gathered guards and servants. Selena, keeping close behind him. When they reached the edge of the crowd and beheld the body, her hands slacked at her side. Cole cursed with ex impressive violence. She didn't know where to look first. At the body with the gaping chest cavity and missing brain and face, at the claw marks gouged at the ground, or at the two ward marks drawn on either side of the body in chalk. Her blood went cold. There was no denying their connection now. The crowd continued talking as the captain approached the body, then turned to one of the guards watching him. Who is it? Varen Yislich, Selena said before the guard could reply. She'd recognized Varen's curly hair anywhere. Varen had been at the head of the pack since this competition started. Whatever had killed him? What kind of animal makes scratches like these? She asked Cole, but didn't need to hear his reply to know that his guess was as good as hers. The claw marks were deep, a quarter of an inch at least. She crouched beside one and ran a finger along the interior edge. It was jagged, but clean, into the stone floor. Her brows nodding, she scanned the other claw marks. There's no blood in these claw marks, she said, twisting her head to look over her shoulder at Cole. He knelt beside her as she pointed to them. They're clean. Which means? She frowned, fighting the chill that ran down her arms. What if it did this chop in its nails before it gutted him? And why is that important? She stood, looking up and down the hallway, then squatted again. It means this thing had the time to do it before it attacked him. It could have done it while it lying in wait. She shook her head. 
Those torches along the wall are almost burnt as stumps. There aren't any signs of them being extinguished before the attack. There are no traces of sooty water. If Aaron died last night, then those torches were still burning when he died. And? And look at this hallway. The nearest door is fifty feet down, and the nearest corner is a bit further than that. If these torches were burning, then Varen would have seen whatever it was, long before it got to this spot. So why get so near it? She asked, more to herself than anything. What if it wasn't an animal, but a person? And what if that person disabled Varen long enough for them to summon this creature? She pointed to Varen's legs. There's a clean cuts around his ankles. His tendons were snapped by a knife, to keep him from running. She moved next to the body, taking care not to disturb the ward marks etched into the ground, as she lifted Varen's rigid and cold hand. Look at his fingernails, she swallowed hard. The tips are cracked and shattered. She used her own nail to scrape over the dirt beneath his nails, smeared it across her palm. See? She held out a hand for, for Cole to observe. Dust and bits of stone. She pulled aside Varen's arm, revealing faint lines in the stone beneath. Fingernail marks. He was desperate to get away, to drag himself by his fingertips if necessary. He was alive the entire thing, the time that thing sharpened its claws in the stone while its master watched. So what does that mean? She smiled grimly at him. It means that you're in a lot of trouble. And as Cole's face paled, Selena realized with a jolt that perhaps the champion's killer and Eleanor's mysterious evil force might be one and the same. Seated at the dining table, Selena flipped through the book. Nothing, nothing, nothing. She scanned page after page for any sign of the two ward marks that had been drawn beside Varen's body. There had to be a connection. She stopped as a map of Relia appeared. Maps had always interested her. There was something bewitching in knowing one's precise location in relation to others on the earth. She gently traced a finger along the eastern coast. She began to the south. In the south, at Benjali, the Ilwe capital, then up, curving and snaking all the way to Rifthold. Her finger then travelled through me, the north and inland to Orinth, then back, back to the sea, to the Saurian coast, and finally to the very tip of the continent and the North Sea beyond. She stared at Orinth, that city of light and learning, the pearl of Aurelia and the capital of Terrison, her birthplace. Selina slammed the shut of the book. Glancing around a room, the assassin let out a long sigh. When she managed to sleep, her dreams were haunted by ancient battles, by swords with eyes, by ward marks that swirled around her head and blinding her with the bright colours. She could see in the gleaming armour of fey and mortal warriors, hear the clash of shields and the snarl of vicious beasts, and smell blood and rotting corpses all around her. Carnage trailed in awake. Ardalan's assassin shuddered. So oh, good. I hoped you'd still be awake, so the crown prince said, and Selene jumped from her seat to find Dorian approaching. He looked tired and a bit ruffled. She opened her mouth, then shook her head. What are you doing here? It's almost midnight, and I've got a test tomorrow. She couldn't deny having him here was a bit of a relief. The murderer only seemed to attack champions when they were alone. Have you moved from literature to history? He surveyed the books on the table. A brief history of modern Aurelia. He read. Symbols and power, Eloy culture and customs. He raised an eyebrow. I read what I like. He slid into the seat beside her, his leg brushing hers. Is there a connection between all of these? No, it is quite a lie, though she had hoped for all of them to contain something about ward marks, or what they meant beside a corpse. I suppose you heard about Varen's death. Of course, he said, a dark expression crossing his handsome face. He was all too aware of how close his leg was but she couldn't bring herself to shift away. And you're not at all concerned that so many champions have been brutally murdered at the hands of someone's feral beast? Dorian leaned in, his eyes fixed on hers. All these murders occurred in dark, isolated hallways. You're never without guards, and your chambers are well watched. I'm not concerned for myself, she said sharply, pulling back a bit, which wasn't entirely true. I just think that it reflects poorly on your esteemed father to have all this going on. When was the last time you bothered to care for the reputation of my esteemed father? Since I became his son's champion. So perhaps you ought to devote some additional resources to dissolving these murders for I win before I win this absurd competition just because I'm the last one left alive. Any more demands? He asked, still close enough for her lips to graze his if she dared. 
I'll let you know if I think of any. Their eyes locked. A slow smile spread across his face. What sort of a man was the crown prince? Though she didn't want to admit it, it was nice to have someone around. Even if he was, a Villiard. She pushed claw marks and brainless corpses from her thoughts. Why are you so dishevelled? Has Caitlin been clawing at you? Caitlin? Thankfully, not recently. But what a miserable day it was. The pups are mutts. And? He put his head into his hands. Pups. One of my bitches gave birth to a litter of mongrels. Before they were too young to tell, but now, well, I'd hoped for purebreds. Are we speaking of dogs or of women? Which would you prefer? He gave her an impish grin. Oh, hush up, she hissed, and he chuckled. Why, might I ask, are you so dishevelled? His smile faltered. Cole told me he took you to see the body. I hope it wasn't too harrowing. Not at all, it's just that I haven't slept well. Me neither, he admitted, he straightened. Will you play the pianoforte for me? Selena tapped her foot on the floor, wondering how he had moved on to such a different subject. Of course not. You played beautifully. If I had known someone was spying on me, I wouldn't have played at all. Why is playing so personal for you? He leaned back in his chair. I can't hear or play music with that. Never mind. No, tell me what you were going to say. Nothing interesting, she said, stacking the books. Does it stir up memories? She eyed him, searching for any sign of mockery. Sometimes. Memories of your parents? He, s he reached to help her stack the remaining books. Selena stood suddenly. Don't ask such stupid questions. I'm sorry if I pried. She didn't respond. The door in her mind that kept locked, she kept locked at all times had been cracked open by the question. And she now tried frantically to close it. Seeing his face, seeing him so near to her, the door shut and she turned the key. It's just, he said, oblivious to the battle that had just occurred, it's just that I don't know anything about you. I'm an assassin, heartbeat calmed. That's all there is to know. Yes, he said with a sigh, but why is it so wrong for me to want to know more? Like how you became an assassin, and what things were like for you before that? It's not interesting. I wouldn't find it boring. She didn't say anything. Please? One question, and I promise, nothing too sensitive. Her mouth twisted to the side, and she looked at the table. What harm was there in a question? She could choose not to reply. Very well. He grinned. I need a moment to think of a good one. She rolled her eyes, but sat down. After a few seconds, he asked. Why do you like music so much? She made a face. You said nothing sensitive. Is that prying? How different is that from asking you why you like to read? No, no, that question is fine. She let out a long breath through her nose and stared at the table. I like music, she said slowly, because when I hear it, I, I lose myself within myself. If that makes sense, I become empty and full at once, and I feel the whole earth roiling around me. When I play, I'm not, for once, I'm not destroying, I'm creating. She chewed on her lip. I used to want to be a healer, back when I was, back before this became my profession. When I was almost too young to remember, I wanted to be a healer. She shrugged. Music reminds me of that feeling. She laughed under her breath. I've never told anyone about that. She admitted, then saw a smile. Don't mock me. He shook his head, ripping the smile from his lips. I'm not robbing, mocking you. I'm just... Unused to hear people speaking from the heart. Well, yes. She smiled slightly. Now it's my turn. Are there any limitations? No, he tucked his hands behind his head. I'm not nearly as private as you are. She made a face as she thought of a question. Why aren't you married yet? Married? I'm nineteen. Yes, but you're the crown prince. He crossed his arms. She tried not to notice the cut of muscle that shifted just beneath the fabric of his shirt. Ask another question. I want to hear your answer. It must be interesting if you're so ardently resisting. He looked at the window and the snow that swirled beyond. I'm not married, he said softly, because I can't stomach the idea of marrying a woman inferior to me in mind and spirit. 
it would mean the death of my soul. Marriage is a legal contract. It's not a sacred thing. As crown prince, you should have given up such fanciful notions. What if you're ordered to marry for the sake of an alliance? Would you start a war because of your romantic ideals? It's not like that. Oh, your father wouldn't command you to marry some princess in order to strengthen the empire? My father has an army to do that for him. You could easily love some woman on the side. Marriage doesn't mean you can't love other people. His sapphire eyes flashed. You marry the person you love and none other, he said, and she laughed. You're mocking me. You're laughing in my face. You deserve to be laughed at for such foolish thoughts. I spoke from my soul. You speak only from selfishness. You're remarkably judgmental. What's the point in having a mind if you don't make it, use it to make judgments? What's the point in having a heart if you don't use it to spare others from the harsh judgments of your mind? It well said, your highness, he stared at her sullenly. Come now, I didn't wound you that severely. You've attempted to ruin my dreams and ideals. I get enough of that from my mother as it is. You're just being cruel. I'm being practical. There's a difference. And you're the crown prince of Adalin. You're in a position where it's, it's possible for you to change Aurelia for the better. You could help create a world where true love isn't needed to secure a happy ending. And what sort of world would I need to create for that to happen? A world where men govern themselves. You speak of anarchy and treason. I do not speak of anarchy. Call me a traitor all you like. I've been convicted as an assassin already. He sidled closer to her and his fingers brushed hers, calloused, warm and hard. You can't resist the opportunity to respond to everything I say, can you? She felt restless, but at the same time, remarkably still. Something was brought to life and laid asleep in his gaze. Your eyes are very strange, she said. i never seen any with such a bright ring of gold. If you're attempting to woo me with flattery, I'm afraid it won't work. I was merely observing... I have no agenda. He looked at his hand, still touching hers. Where did you get that ring? She contracted a hand into a fist. She pulled it away from him. The amethyst in a ring glowed in the firelight. It was a gift. From whom? It's none of your concern. He shrugged, though she knew better than to tell him who had really given it to her. Rather, she knew Cole wouldn't want Dorian to know. I'd like to know who's been giving rings to my champion. The way the co collar of his black jacket lay across his neck made her unable to sit still. She wanted to touch him, to trace the line between his tan skin and the golden lining of the fabric. Billets? she asked, rising to her feet. I could use another lesson. Selina didn't wait for his answer as she strode towards the gaming room. She very much wanted to stand close to him and have her skin warm under his breath. She liked that. Worse than that, she realized. She liked him. Cole watched Parrington on his table in the dining hall. When he had approached the Duke about Varen's death, he hadn't seemed bothered. Cole looked around the cavernous hall. In fact, most of the champion sponsors weren't about as usual. Idiots. If Selena was actually right about it, then whoever was responsible for killing the champions could be among them. But which of the members of the King's Council would be so desperate to win, win that he'd do such a thing? Cole stretched his legs beneath the table and shifted his attention back to Parrington. He'd seen how the Duke used his size and title to win allies in the King's Council and keep opponents from challenging him. But it wasn't his maneuverings that had captured the interest of the Captain of the Guard tonight. Rather, it was the moments between the grins and laughter when a shadow passed across the Duke's face. It wasn't an expression of anger or disgust, but a shade that clouded his eyes. It was so strange that when Cole had first seen it, he'd extended his dinner just to see if it happened again. A few moments later, it did. Parrington's eyes became dark and his face cleared, as if he saw everything in the world for it was, and found no joy or amusement in it. Cole leaned back in his chair, sipping his water. He knew little of the Duke, and had never entirely trusted him. Neither had Dorian especially, not after all his talk, using the Hemir as a hostage to get the Ilawi rebels to cooperate. But the Duke was the King's most trusted adviser, and had offered no cause for mistrust other than a fierce belief in Ardalan's right to conquest. Caitlin Rumpier sent a few chairs away. Cole's brows rose slightly. Her eyes were upon Parrington as well, filled not with the longing of a beloved, but with cold contemplation. Cole stretched again, lifting his arms over his head. Where was Dorian? The prince hadn't come to dinner, nor was he in the kennels with the bitch and her pups. His gaze returned to the duke. 
there, would, there it was, for a moment. Perrington's eyes fell upon the black ring on its left hand and darkened, as if his pupils had expanded to encompass all of each eye. Then it was gone. His eyes returned to normal. Cole looked to Caitlin. Had she noticed the odd change? No, her face remained the same. There was no bewilderment, no surprise. Her look became shallow, as if she were more interested in how his jacket might complement her dress. Cole stretched and rose, finishing his apple as she strode from the dining hall. Strange as it was, he had enough to worry about. The Duke was ambitious, but certainly not a threat to the castle and its inhabitants. But even as the captain of the guard walked to his rooms, he couldn't shake the feeling the Duke Parenton had been watching him, too. Chapter 31 Someone was standing at the foot of her bed. Selena knew this long before she opened her eyes, and she eased a hand beneath the pillow, pulling out the makeshift knife she'd crafted of pins, string, and soap. That's unnecessary, a woman said, and Selena sat upright at the sound of Elena's voice. It would be wholly ineffective. Her blood went cold at the sight of the shimmering spectre of the first queen of a darling. Though Anna, Elena looked fully formed, the edges of her body gleamed as though made from starlight. Her long silver hair flowed around her beautiful face, and she smiled as Selena set down a miserably pathetic knife. Hello, child, the queen said. What do you want? Selena demanded, but kept her voice down. Was she dreaming, or could the cards hear her? She tensed, her legs preparing to leap from the bed perhaps towards the balcony since Eleanor stood between her and the door. Simply to remind you that you must win this competition. I already planned to. She'd been woken up for this. And it's not for you, she added coldly. I'm doing it for my freedom. Do you have anything useful to say, or are you just here to bother me? Or maybe you could just tell me more about this evil thing that's hunting the champions down one by one. Eleanor sighed, lifting her eyes to the ceiling. I know as little as you. When Selena's frown didn't disappear, Elena said, You don't trust me yet, I understand, but you and I are on the same side, whether you allow yourself to believe it or not. She lowered her gaze to the assassin, pinning her with the intensity of it. I came here to warn you, to keep an eye on your right. Excuse me? Selena cocked her head. What does that mean? Look to your right. You'll find the answers there. Selena looked to her right, but all she saw was the tapestry that concealed the tomb. She opened her mouth to snap a response when she looked back at Eleanor. The queen was gone. At her test the next day, Selena studied the small table before her and all the goblets it contained. It had been over two weeks since Samhuin, and while she passed yet another test, knife throwing to her relief, another champion had been found dead just two days ago. To say she was getting little sleep these days was an understatement when she wasn't searching for any indication of what the ward marks around the corpses had meant, she spent most of the night awake, watching the windows and doors, listening for the scrape of claw on stone. The royal guards outside her rooms didn't help. If this beast was capable of gouging marvel, it couldn't take down a few men. Brulo stood at the front of the sparring hall, his hands clasped behind his back, watching the thirteen remaining competitors standing at thirteen individual tables. He glanced at the clock. Selena looked at it too. She had five minutes left. Five minutes during which she had not only had to identify the poisons in seven goblets, but arrange them in the order most benign to the deadliest. The true test, however, would come at the end of the five minutes, when they were to drink from the goblet they deemed the most harmless. If they got the answer wrong, even with the antidotes in hand, it would be unpleasant. Selena rolled her neck and lifted one of the goblets to her nose, sniffing. Sweet. Too sweet. She swallowed the dessert, wine they used to conceal the sweetness. But in the bronze goblet, it was difficult to see the colour. She dipped her finger into the cup, studying the purple liquid as it dripped off her nail. Definitely belladonna. She looked at the other goblets she had identified. Hemlock, Bloodroot, Monkshood, Oleander. She shifted the goblets into order, squeezing in belladonna just before the goblet, containing a lethal dose of Oleander. Three minutes left. Selena picked up the penultimate goblet and sniffed. It sniffed again. It didn't smell like anything. She shifted her face away from the table and sniffed the air, hoping to clear her nostrils. When trying perfumes, people sometimes lose their sense of smell after sniffing too many. Which is why perfumers usually kept something on site to keep 
help clear the scent from the nose. She sniffed the goblet again, and dunked her finger in. It smelled like water. It looked like water. Perhaps it was just water. She set down the glass and picked up the final goblet. When she sniffed it, the wine inside didn't have any unusual smell. It seemed fine. She bit her lip and glanced at the clock. Two minutes left. Some of the other champions were cursing under the breath. Whoever got the order most wrong went home. Selena sniffed the water goblet again, racing through a list of odorless poisons. None of them could be combined with water, not without colouring it. She picked up the wine goblet, swelling the liquid. Wine could conceal any number of advanced poisons. But which one was it? At the table to the left of her, Knox ran his hands through his dark hair. He had three goblins in front of him, the other four in line behind him. Ninety seconds left. Poisons, poisons, poisons. Her mouth went dry. If she lost, would Eleanor haunt her from spite? Selena glanced to the right to find Pella, the gangly young assassin, watching her. He was down to the same two goblets that she struggled with, and she watched as he put the water glass at the very end of the spectrum, the most poisonous, and the wine glass at the other. His eyes flicked to hers, and his chin drooped in a barely detectable nod. He put his hands in his pockets. He was done. Selena turned to her own goblets before Grullo, Brullo could catch her. Poisons. That's what Pella had said during the first test. He was trained in poisons. She glanced at him sidelong. He stood to her right. Look to your right. You'll find the answers there. A chill went down her spine. Eleanor had been telling the truth. Pella stared at the clock, watching him count down the seconds until the test was over. But why help her? She moved the water glass to the end of the line and put the wine glass first. Because aside from her, Kane's favourite champion to taunt was Pella, and because when she'd been in Endeavour, the allies she'd made hadn't been the da darlings of the overseers, but the ones the overseers had hated the most. The outsiders looked out for each other. None of the other champions had bothered to pay attention to Pella, even Brulo. It seemed, had forgotten Pella's claim that first day. If he'd known, he would never have allowed them to do the tests so publicly. Time's up. Make your final order, Brulo said, and Selena stared at a line of goblets for a moment longer. On the side of the room, Dorian and Cole watched with crossed arms. Had they noticed Pella's help? Knox cursed colourfully and shoved his remaining glasses into line, many of the competitors doing the same. Antidotes were on hand in case mistakes were made, and as Brulo began going through the tables, telling the champions the drink, he handed them out frequently. Most of them assumed the wine had nothing in it was a trap, and placed it towards the end of the spectrum. Even Knox wound up chugging a vial of antidote. He'd put Monkswood first. And Cain, to a delight, wound up going purple in the face after consuming Belladonna. As he guzzled down the antidote, she wished Brulo had somehow ran out. So far, none, of the, none had won the test. One champion drank the water and was on the ground before Brulo could hand in the antidote. Blood vein, a horrible, painful poison. Even consuming just a little would cause vivid, vivid hallucinations and disorientation. Thankfully, the weapons master forced him to swallow the antidote, though the champion still had to be rushed to the castle infirmary. At last, Brulo stopped at a table, surveying a line of goblets. His face revealed nothing as he said, On with it, then. Selena glanced at Pella, whose hazel eyes shone as she lifted the glass of wine to her lips and drank a sip. Nothing. No strange taste, no immediate sensation. Some poisons could take longer to affect you, but... Brulo extended a fist to her, and her stomach clenched. Was the antidote inside? But his fingers splayed, and he only clapped her on the back. The right one, just wine, he said, and the champions murmured behind him. He moved on to Pella and the last champion, and the youth drank the glass of wine. Brulo grinned at him, grasping his shoulder. Another winner! Applause rippled through the sponsors and trainers, and Selena flashed an appreciative grin in the assassin's direction. He grinned back, going red from his neck to his copper hair. So she'd cheated a little, but she'd won. She could handle sharing the victory with an ally. And yes, Eleanor was looking out for her. But that didn't change anything. Even if her path and Eleanor's demands were now tied closely together, she wouldn't become the king's champion just to serve some ghost's agenda an agenda that Eleanor had twice now failed to reveal, even if Eleanor had told her how to win the test. Chapter 32 
After cutting short the lesson in favor of a stroll, Selena and Nehemia walked through the spacious halls of the castle, guards trailing behind them. Whatever Nehemia thought of the flock of guards that followed Selena everywhere, she didn't say anything. Despite the fact that Yulmus was a month away and the final duel five days after that, every evening for an hour before dinner, Selena and the princess divided their time equally between Ilaway and the common tongue. Selena and Nehemia read from her library books, then forced her to copy letter after letter until they looked flawless. Since they'd begun their lessons, the princess had greatly improved her fluency in the common tongue, though the girls still spoke Ilaway. Perhaps it was for ease and comfort, perhaps it was to see the raised eyebrows and gaping mouths when others overheard them, perhaps it was to keep the conversations private. For whichever reason, the assassin found the language preferable. At least, Enver had taught her something. You're quiet today, Nehemia said. Is something the matter? Selena smiled weakly. Something was the matter. She'd slept so poorly the previous night that she'd wished for dawn to arrive early. Another champion was dead, not to mention there was still the matter of Elena's commands. I was up late reading, Zor. They entered the part of the castle that Selena had never seen before. I sense much worry in you, Nehemia said suddenly, and I hear much that you do not say. You never voice any of your troubles, though your eyes betray them. Was she so transparent? We're friends, Nehemia said softly. When you need me, I'll be there. Selena's throat tightened, and she put a hand on Nehemia's shoulder. No one has called me a friend in a long time, the assassin said. I... An inky black crept into the corner of her memory, and she struggled against it. There are parts of me that I... I... She heard it then, the sound that haunted her dreams. Hooves, pounding thunderous hooves. Selena shook her head and the sound stopped. Thank you, Nehemia, she said with sincerity. You're a true friend. Her heart was raw and trembling, and the darkness faded. Nehemia suddenly groaned. The queen asked me to watch some acting troupe perform one of her favorite plays tonight. Will you go with me? I could use a translator. Selena frowned. I'm afraid that you can't go. Nehemia's voice was tinted with annoyance, and Selena gave her friend an apologetic look. There are certain things that... Selena began, but the princess shook her head. We all have our secrets, though I am curious why you are so closely watched by that captain and locked in your rooms at night. If I were a fool, I'd say they're afraid of you. The assassin smiled. Men will always be silly about such things. She thought about what the princess had said, and worry slipped into her stomach. So, are you actually on good terms with the Queen of an Island? You didn't really make an effort to start off that way. The princess nodded, lifting her chin. You know that the situation between our countries is unpleasant right now. While I might have been a little distant with Georgina at first, I realized that it might be in Ilaway's best interest if I make more of an effort. So I've been speaking with her for some weeks now, hoping to make her aware of how we might improve our relations. I think inviting me tonight is a sign that I might be getting some pro progress. And Selena realized. Through Georgina, Nehemia would also get to the king of Adalin's ear. Selena bit her lip, but then quickly smiled. I'm sure your parents are pleased. They turned down a hall, and the sound of barking dogs filled the air. Where are we? The kennels, Nehemia beamed. The prince showed me the pups yesterday, though I think he was looking, just looking for an excuse to get out of his mother's court for a while. It was bad enough, for they were walking together without coal, but to enter the kennels. Are we allowed to be here? Nehemia straightened. I am Princess of Ilue, she said. I can go wherever I please. Selena followed the princess through a large wooden door, wrinkling her nose at the sudden smell. The assassin walked past cages and stores filled with dogs of many different breeds. Some were so large they came up to a hip, where others, where others had legs the length of a hand, with bodies as long as her arms. The breeds were all fascinating and beautiful, but the sleek hounds ar aroused all within her breast. Their arched, undersized, and slender long legs were full of grace and speed. They did not yap as the other dogs did, but sat perfectly still and watched her with dark, wise eyes. Are these, are these all hunting dogs? Selena asked, but Nehemia disappeared. She could, hear a, she could hear a voice, and the voice of another, and then saw a hand extended from within a store to beckon Selena inside. 
The assassin hurried to the pen and looked down over the gate. Dorian Havilian smiled at her as Nehemia took a seat. Why, hello, Lady Lillian, he purred, and set aside a brown gold puppy. I didn't expect to see you here, though with Nehemia's passion for hunting, I can't say I'm surprised she finally dragged you along. Selena stared at the four dogs. These are the mutts. Dorian picked one up and stroked its head. Pity, isn't it? I still can't resist their charm. Carefully watching Nehemia laugh as two dogs leapt upon her and buried her beneath tongues and wagging tails, the assassin opened the pen door and slipped inside. Nehemia pointed to the corner. Is that dog sick? she asked. There was a fifth pup, a bit larger than the others, and its coat was a silky, silvery gold that shimmered in the shadows. It opened its dark eyes as if it knew that it was being spoken about and watched them. It was a beautiful animal, and had Selina not known better, she would have thought it purebred. It's not sick, Dorian said. It just has a foul disposition. It won't come near anyone, human or canine. With good reason, Selina said, stepping over the legs of the crown prince and nearing the fifth pup. Why should it touch someone like you? If it won't respond to humans, then all we have to be killed, Dorian said offhandedly, and a spark went through Selina. Kill it? Kill it? For what reason? What did it do to you? It would make a suitable pet, which is what all these dogs will become. So you'd kill it because of its temperament? It can't help being that way. She looked around. Where's its mother? Perhaps it needs her. Its mother only sees them to nurse and a few hours of socialization. I usually raise these dogs for racing and hunting, not for cuddling. It's cruel to keep it from its mother. The assassin reached into the shadow and scooped the puppy into her hands. She held it against her chest. I won't let you harm it. If its spirit is strange, he offered, it would be a burden. A burden? To whom? It's nothing to be upset about, Dorian said. Plenty of dogs are painlessly laid to rest each day. I don't see why you would object to that. But don't kill this one, she said. Let me keep it, if only so you don't kill it. Dorian observed her. If it upsets you that much, I won't have it killed. I'll arrange for a home and I'll even ask for your approval before I make a final decision. You do that? What's the dog's life to me? If it pleases you, then it shall happen. Her face burned as he rose to his feet, standing close. You... You promise? He put a hand on his heart. I swear on my crown that the pup shall live. She was suddenly aware of how near to touching they were. Thank you. Nehemia watched them from the floor, her brows raised, until one of her personal guards appeared at the gate. It is time to go, princess, he said anyway. You must dress for your evening with the queen. The princess stood, pushing past the bouncing puppies. Do you want to walk with me? Nehemia said in the common tongue to Selina. Selina nodded and opened the gate for him. Shutting the gate, she looked back at the crown prince. Well, aren't you coming with us? He slumped down into the pen and the puppies immediately leapt on him. Perhaps I'll see you later tonight. If you're lucky, Selina purred and walked away. She smiled to herself as they strode through the castle. Eventually, Nehemia turned to her. Do you like him? Selina made a face. Of course not. Why would I? You converse easily. It seems as if you have a connection. A connection? Selina choked on the word. I just enjoy teasing him. It's not a crime if you consider him handsome. I'll admit I judged him wrong. I thought him to be a pompous, selfish idiot. But he's not so bad. He's a villiard. My mother was the daughter of a chief who sought to overthrow my grandfather. We're both silly. It's nothing. He seems to take a great interest in you. Selina's head whipped around, her eyes full of long, forgotten fury that made her belly ache and twist. I would sooner cut out my own heart and love a billiard, she snarled. They completed their walk in silence. When they parted ways, Selina quickly wished Nehemia a pleasant evening before striding to her part at the castle. 
The few guards that followed her remained a respectful distance away, a distance that grew greater each day. Perhaps on Cole's orders? Night had recently fallen in the skies, remained a deep purple, staining the snow piled upon the panes of the windows. She could easily walk right out to the castle, stock up on supplies in Rifthold, and be on a ship to the south by morning. Selina stopped at a window, leaning it close to the panes. The guards stopped too and said nothing as they waited. The coldness from outside seeped in, kissing her face. Would they expect her to go south? Perhaps going north would be the unexpected choice. No one went north in winter unless they had a death wish. Something shifted in the reflection of the window and she whirled as she beheld the man standing behind her. But Cain didn't smile at her, not that mocking way. Instead, he panted, his mouth opening and closing like a fish drenched from water. His dark eyes were wide, and he had hand around his enormous throat. Hopefully he was choking to death. Is something wrong? she asked sweetly, leaning against the wall. He glanced from side to side at the guards at the window before his eyes snapped to her. His grip on his throat tightened as if to silence the words that fought to come out and the ebony ring on his finger gleamed dully. Even though it should have been impossible, he seemed to have packed on an additional ten pounds of muscle in the past few days. In fact, every time she saw him, Cain seemed to be bigger and bigger. Her brows knotted and she crossed her arms. Cain, she said, but he took off down the hall like a jackrabbit, faster than he would have any ability to run. He peered a few times over his shoulder, not at her, or the confused and murmuring cards, but as something beyond. Selina waited until the sounds of his fleeing footsteps faded, then hurried back to her own rooms. She sent messages to Knox and Pella, not explaining why, but just telling them to stay in their chambers that night, and not open the door for anyone. Chapter 33 Caitlin pinched her cheeks as she emerged from the dressing room. Her servants sprayed perfume, and the young woman gulped down sugar water before putting a hand on the door. She'd been in the midst of smoking a pipe when Duke Parrington had been announced. She'd fled into the dressing room and changed her clothes, hoping the scent wouldn't linger. If he found out about the opium, she could just blame it on the horrible headaches she'd been having lately. Caitlin passed through her bedroom into the foyer and then into the sitting room. He looked ready for battle as always. Your Grace, she said, curtsying. The world was foggy around the edges, and her body felt heavy. He kissed her hand when she offered it, his lips soggy around her skin. Their eyes met as he looked up from her hand, and a piece of the world slipped away. How far would she go to secure her position at Dorian's side? I hope I didn't disturb you, he said, releasing her hand. The walls of the room appeared in the floor and the ceiling, and she had the distinct feeling that she was trapped in a box. A lovely cage filled with tapestries and cushions. I was only napping, my lord, she said, sitting down. He sniffed, and Caitlin would have felt immensely nervous were it not for the drug curling around her mind. To what do I owe the pleasure of this unexpected visit? I wish to inquire after you. I didn't see you at dinner. Parenton crossed his arms, arms that looked capable of crushing a skull. I was indisposed. He resisted the urge to rest her too heavy head on the couch. He said something to her, but she found that her ears had stopped hearing. His skin seemed to harden and glaze over, and his eyes became unforgiving marble orbs. Even the thinning hair was frozen in stone. She gaped as the white mouth continued to move, revealing a throat of carved marble. I'm sorry, she said. I'm not feeling well. Shall I fetch you water? The duke stood. Or shall I go? No, she said, almost crying out, her heart twitched. What I mean is, I I'm well enough to enjoy your company, but you must forgive my absent-mindedness. I wanted to call you absent-minded, Lady Caitlin, he said, sitting down. You're one of the cleverest women I've met. His highness told me the same thing yesterday. Caitlin's spine snapped and straightened. She saw Dorian's face in the crown that sat upon his head. Th the prince said that? About me? The duke put a hand on her knee, stroking it with his thumb. Of course. Then Lady Lillian interrupted before he could say more. Her head spun. Why was she with him? I don't know. I wish it were otherwise. She must do something, something to stop this. The girl moved fast, 
too fast for her maneuvering. Lillian had snared the crown prince in a net, and now Caitlin must cut him free. Parrington could do that. He could make Lillian disappear and never be found. No. Lillian was a lady, and a, and a man with as much honour as Parrington would never harm one of a noble birth. Or would he? Skeletons danced in circles around her head. But what if he thought Lillian weren't a lady? A headache flared through life, with a sudden burst that sucked the air from her lungs. I had the same reaction, she said, rubbing her temple. It's hard to believe someone as disreputable disrepe as the Lady Lillian won the heart of the prince. Maybe the headaches would stop once she was at Dorian's side. Perhaps it would do some good if someone spoke to his highness. Disreputable? I heard from someone that her background is not as pure as it should be. What have you heard? Parrington demanded. Caitlin played with the jewel hanging from a bracelet. I didn't get specifics, but some of the nobility don't believe her to be a worthy companion of anyone in this court. I'd like to learn more about the Lady Lillian, wouldn't you? It's our duty as loyal subjects to the crown to protect our prince from such forces. Indeed it is, the duke said quietly. Something wild and foreign issued a cry within her, shattering through the pain in her head, and thoughts of poppies and cages faded away. She must do what was necessary to save the crown and a future. Selina looked up from the ancient from an ancient book of wardmark theories as the door creaked open, and hinges squealing loudly enough to wake the dead. Her heart skipped a beat and she tried to appear as casual as possible. But it was not Dorian Haviliad who entered, nor was it a ferocious creature. The door finished opening, and Nehemia, clad in gold, worked wonder, stood before her. She didn't look at Selina, nor did she move as she stood in the doorway. Her eyes were upon the floor, and rivers of coal ran down her cheeks. Nehemia, Selina asked, getting to her feet, what happened to the play? Nehemia's shoulders rose and fell. Slowly she lifted her head, revealing red-rimmed eyes. I don't know where else to go, she said in a Selena found breathing a bit difficult as she asked. What happened? It was then that Selena noticed the piece of paper in, Sel in Nehemia's hands. It trembled in her grasp. They massacred them, Nehemia whispered, her eyes wide. She shook her head, as if she were denying her own words. Selena went still. Who? Nehemia let out a strangled sob, and a part of Selena broke the angry agony of the sound. A legion of Darlin's army captured five hundred either way rebels hiding on the border of Oakwood Forest and the Stone Marshes. Tears dripped from Nehemia's cheeks and onto her white dress. She crumbled the piece of paper in her hand. My father says they were to go to Halakula as prisoners of war, but some of the rebels tried to escape on the journey. And Nehemia breathed hard, fighting to get the words out. And the soldiers killed them all as punishment. Even the children. Selena's dinner rose in her throat. Five hundred butchered. Selena became aware of Nehemia's personal guards standing in the doorway, their eyes gleaming. How many of the rebels had been people that they knew, and Nehemia had somehow helped and protected? What is the point in being a princess of Eloi if I cannot help my people? Nehemia said. How can I call myself the princess when such things happen? I'm so sorry, Selina whispered, as if those words broke the spell that had been holding the princess in place. Nehemia rushed into her arms, her gold jewelry pressed hard into Selina's skin. Nehemia wept. Unable to say anything, the assassin simply held her, for as long as it took for the pain to ease. Chapter 34 Selina sat by a window in a bedroom, watching the snow dance in the night air. Nehemia had long since returned to her own rooms, tears dried and shoulders squared once more. The clock chimed eleven, and Selina stretched, but they stopped as pain seized the stomach. She bent over, focusing on her breathing and waiting for the cramp to pass. She'd been like this for an hour now. She pulled a blanket tight around herself, the heat of the roaring fire not adequately reaching a seat by the window. Thankfully, Philippa entered, extending her a cup of tea. Here, child. She said. This will help. 
She placed it on the table beside the assassin and rested an arm and hand on the armchair. Pity what happened to those Hilaway rebels, she said quietly enough, though no listening ears might hear. I can't imagine what the princess must be feeling. Selena felt anger bubble alongside the pain in her stomach. She's fortunate to have a good friend like you, though. Selena touched Philippa's hand. Thank you. She grabbed her teacup and hissed, almost dropping it on her lap as the scalding hot cup bit into her hand. Careful now, Philippa chuckled. I don't know assassins could be so clumsy. If you need anything, send word. I've had my fair share of monthly pains. Philippa ruffled Selena's hair and left. Selena would have thanked her again, but another wave of cramping took over, and she leaned forward as the door closed. Her weight gain over the past three and a half months had allowed for her monthly cycles to return, after near starvation in Endeavour had made them vanish. Selena groaned. How was she going to train like this? The duel was four weeks away. The snowflakes sparkled and shimmered beyond the glass panes of the window, twirling and weaving as they flew to the ground in a waltz that was beyond human compression, comprehension. How could Eleanor expect her to defeat some evil in this castle, when there's so much more out of it? Out there. What was any of this compared to what was occurring in other kingdoms? As close as Endeavour and Calicula, even. The door to her bedroom opened and someone approached. I heard about a Nehemia. It was Cole. What are you... Isn't it late for you to be here? She asked, pulling the blankets tight. I... Are you sick? I'm indisposed. Because of what happened to those rebels? Didn't he get it? Selena grimaced. No, I'm truly feeling unwell. It makes me sick, too. Cole murmured, glance glaring at the floor. All of it. And after seeing the Nevoir, he rubbed his face as if he could clear away the memories of it. Five hundred people, he whispered. Stunned at what he was admitting, she could only watch. Listen, he began starting to pace. I know that I'm sometimes aloof with you, and I know you complain about it to a Dorian, but he turned to her. It's a good thing that you befriended the princess, and I appreciate your honesty and unwavering friendship with her. I know there were rumors about Nehemia's connections to the rebels in Ulay, but... But I'd like to think that if my country works conquered, I would stop at nothing to win back my people's freedom, too. She would have replied were it not for the deep pain that wrapped around her lower spine and the sudden churning in her stomach. I might... He started looking out the window. I might have been wrong. The world began to spin and tilt, and Selena closed her eyes. She always had trouble cramping, usually accompanied by nausea. But she wouldn't vomit. Not right now. Cole, she began, putting a hand over her mouth as nausea swelled and took control. It's just that I take great pride in my job, he continued. Cole, she said again. Oh, she was going to vomit. And you're a darling's assassin, but I was wondering if... If you wanted to. Cole, she warned, and as he pivoted, Selena vomited all over the floor. He made a disgusted noise, jumping back a foot. Tears sprang up as the bitter, sharp taste filled her mouth. She hung over her knees, letting drool and bile spill on the floor. Are you? By the ward. You're really sick, aren't you? He called for a servant, helping her from the chair. The world was clearer now. What had been ask what had he been asking? Uh, come on, let's get you in into bed. I'm not ill like that, she groaned. He sat her on the bed peeling back the blankets. A servant entered frowning at the mess on the floor and shouted for help. Then, in what way? I... Uh... Her face was so hot she thought it would melt onto the floor. Oh, you idiot! My monthly cycles finally came back. His face suddenly matched hers, and he stepped away, dragging a hand through his short brown hair. Uh, I... Uh, if... Uh, then th I'll take my leave... He stammered and bowed. Selina raised an eyebrow and then, despite herself, smiled as he left the room as quickly as his feet could go without running, tripping slightly in the doorway as he staggered into the rooms beyond. Selina looked at the servants, cleaning. I'm so sorry, she started, but they waved her off. 
Embarrassed and aching, the assassin climbed further into her bed and nestled beneath the covers, hoping sleep would come soon. But sleep wouldn't come soon, and while a while later the door opened again, and someone laughed. I intercepted Ko, and he informed me of your condition. You'd think a man in his position wouldn't be so squeamish, especially after examining all those corpses. Slena opened an eye and frowned as Dorian sat on her bed. I'm in a state of absolute agony, and I can't be bothered. It can't be that bad, he said, fishing a deck of cards from his jacket. Want to play? I already told you that I don't feel well. You look fine to me. He skillfully shuffled the deck. Just one game. Don't you pay people to entertain you? He glowered, breaking the deck. You should be honoured by my company. I'd be honoured if you would leave. For someone who relies on my good graces, you're very bold. Bold? I've barely begun. Lying on her side, she curled her knees to her chest. He laughed, pocketing the deck of cards. Your new canine companion is doing well, if you wish to know. She moaned to a pillow. Go away. I feel like dying. No fair maiden should die alone, he said, putting a hand on hers. Shall I read to you in your final moments? What story would you like? She snatched her hand back. How about the story of the idiotic prince who won't leave the assassin alone? Oh, I love that story. It has such a happy ending, too. Why the assassin was really feigning her illness in order to get the prince's attention. Who would have guessed it? Such a clever girl. And the bedroom scene is so lovely. It's worth reading through all their ceaseless banter. Out, out, out! Leave me to be and go womanize someone else. She grabbed a book and chucked it at him. He caught it before it broke his nose and her eyes widened. I, I didn't mean that it was an attack. It was a joke. I didn't mean to actually hurt you, your highness, she said in a jumble. I'd hoped that Darlin's assassin would choose to attack me in a more dignified manner. At least with a knife or a sword. Though preferably not in the back. She clutched a belly and bent over. Sometimes she hated being woman. It's Dorian, by the way, not your highness. Very well. Say it. Say what? Say my name. Say, very well, Dorian. She rolled her eyes. If it pleases your magnanimous holiness, I shall call you by your first name. Magnanimous holiness? Oh, I like that one. A ghost of a smile appeared on her face, and Dorian looked down at the book. Uh, this isn't one of your books that I sent you. I don't even own books like these. She laughed weakly and took the tea from the servant as she approached. Of course you don't, Dorian. I had the maid sent for a copy today. Sunset Passions, he read, and opened the book to a random page and read aloud. His hands gently caressed, her ivory silk... Er, his eyes widened. By the wart? You actually read this rubbish? What happened to symbols and power of Eloy customs and culture? She finished a drink, the ginger tea easing her stomach. You may borrow it when I'm done. If you read it, your literary experience will be complete. And, she added with a coy smile, it may, it will give you some creative ideas of things to do with your lady friends. He hissed through his teeth. I will not read this. She took the book from his hands, leaning back. Then I suppose you're just like Cole. Cole? He asked, falling into the trap. You asked Cole to read this? He refused, of course. She lied. He said it wasn't right for him to read the sort of material if I gave it to him. Dorian snatched the book from her hands. Give me that, you demon woman. I will not have you matching us up against each other. He glanced once more at the novel, then turned it over, concealing the title. She smiled and resumed watching the falling snow. It was blisteringly cold now, and even the fire could not warm the blasts of wind that crept through the cracks of her balcony doors. She felt Dorian watching her, and not in the cautious way that Cole sometimes watched her. Rather, Dorian just seemed to be watching her because he enjoyed watching her, and she enjoyed watching him too. Dorian didn't realise he'd been transfixed by her until she straightened and demanded, What are you staring at? You're beautiful, Dorian said before he could think. Don't be stupid. 
Did I offend you? His blood pumped through the room in a strange rhythm. No, she said, and quickly faced the window. Dorian watched her face turn redder and redder. He'd never known an attractive woman suppose for so long without courting her, save Caitlin, and he couldn't deny that he was aching to learn what Selina's lips felt like, what her bare skin smelled like, how she'd react to the touch of his fingers along her body. The week surrounding Yomus was a time of relaxation, a time to celebrate the carnal pleasures that kept one warm on a winter's night. Women wore their hair down, some men refused to don a corset. It was a holiday to feast on the fruits of the harvest and those of the flesh. Naturally, he looked forward to it every year. But now... Now he had a sinking feeling in his stomach. How could he celebrate when word had just arrived of what his father's soldiers had done to these Eloy rebels? They hadn't spared a single life. Five hundred people, all dead. How could he ever look Nehemiah in the face again? And how could he someday rule a country whose soldiers had been trained to have so little compassion for human life? Dorian's mouth went dry. Selina was from Terrison, another conquered country, and his father's first conquest. It was a miracle Selina bothered to acknowledge his existence, or perhaps she'd spent so long in a darling that she'd stopped caring. Somehow Dorian didn't think that was the case. Not when she had the three giant scars on her back to forever remind her of his father's brutality. Is there something the matter? She asked, cautiously, curiously, as if she cared. He took a deep breath, then walked to the window, unable to look at her. The glass was cold beneath his hand as he watched the snowflakes come crashing down to earth. You must hate me, he murmured. Hate me in my court for our frivolity and our mindlessness when so much, so many horrible things are going on outside the city. I heard about those butchered rebels, and I, I'm ashamed, he said, leaning his head against the window. He heard a rise, then slump into a chair. The words came out in a river, one flowing after the other, and he couldn't stop it from speaking. I understand why you'd have such ease when killing my kind. And I don't blame you for it. Dorian, she said gently. The world outside the castle was dark. I know you'll never tell me, he continued, voicing what he wanted to say for some time. But I, I know something terrible happened to you when you were young. Something perhaps of my father's own doing. You have a right to hate our darling for seizing control of Terrison as it did. For taking all of the countries, and the country of your friend. He swallowed his eyes, thinking, You won't believe me, but I don't want to be a part of that. I can't call myself a man when I allow my father to encourage such unforgivable atrocities. Yet even if I pleaded for clemency on behalf of conquered qu kingdoms, he wouldn't listen. Not in this world. This is the world where I only picked you to be my champion because I knew it would annoy my father. She shook her head, but he kept going. But if I had refused to sponsor a champion, my father would have seen it as a sign of dissent. And I'm not yet enough of a man to stand against him like that. So I chose Adalin's assassin to be my champion. Because the choice of my champion was the only choice I had. Yes, it was all clear now. Life shouldn't be like this, he said, their eyes meeting as he guessed another room. And, and the world shouldn't be like this. The assassin was silent, listening to the throbbing of a heart before he spoke. I don't hate you, she said in little more than a whisper. He dropped into the chair across from her and put his head in his hand. He seemed remarkably lonely. And I don't think you are like them. I'm, I'm sorry if I've hurt you. I'm joking most of the time. Hurt me, he said. You haven't hurt me. You've just, you've just made things a little more entertaining. She cocked her head. Just a little? Maybe a, a tad more than that, he stretched out his legs. Ah, if only you could come to the Yuma's ball with me. Be grateful you can't attend. Why can't I attend? And what's the Yuma's ball? He groaned. Nothing all that special. Just the masked ball that happens to be on Yuma's, and I think you know exactly why you can't come. You and Cole really delight in ruining any fun I might have, don't you? I like attending parties. When you're my father's champion, you can attend all the balls you want. 
She made a face. He wanted to tell her then that if he could, he would have asked her to go with him, that he wanted to spend time with her, that he thought of her even when they were apart. But he knew she would have laughed. The clock chimed midnight. I should probably go, he said, stretching his arms. I have a day of council meetings to look forward to tomorrow, and I don't think Duke Parrington will be pleased if I'm half asleep for all of it. Selena smirked. Be sure to give the Duke my warmest regards. There was no way she'd have forgotten how the Duke had treated her on that first day in Endeavour. Dorian hadn't forgotten it either. The thought of the Duke treating her like that again made him burn with cold rage. Without thinking, he leaned forward down and kissed her cheek. She stiffened as his mouth touched her skin, and though the kiss was brief, he breathed in the scent of her, pulling away was surprisingly hard. Rest well, Selena, he said. Good night, Dorian. As he left, he wondered why she suddenly looked so sad, and why she'd pronounced his name, not with tenderness, but with res resignation. Selena stared at the moonlight as it streamed across the ceiling. A masked boar on Eumus. Even, it even if it was the most corrupt and ostent ostentatious court in Aurelia, it sounded dreadfully romantic, and of course she wasn't allowed to go. She let out a long sigh through her nose and tucked her hands beneath her head. Was that what Dor Cole had wanted to ask her before she vomited? A true invitation, invitation to the boar? She shook her head. No, the last thing he'd ever do would be invite her to a royal boar. Besides, both of them had more important things to worry about, like whoever was killing the champions. Perhaps she should have sent word to him about Cain's strange behaviour earlier that afternoon. Selena closed her eyes and smiled. She could think of no nicer humorous gift than for Cain to be found dead the next morning. Still, as the clock marked the passing hours, Selena kept a vigil, waiting, wondering what truly lurked in the castle, and unable to stop thinking of those five hundred dead Elobe rebels buried in some unmarked grave.